We're going to continue with part three today of this series in the zone. And in the zone, specifically, we're talking about being in the center of God's will, because in the center of God's will is where you and I are going to find contentment. In the center of God's will is where you and I are going to have that fulfillment in our lives. Uh, in the center of God's will for our lives is where we find our stability, where we find our purpose, where we find meaning to life. Amen? Amen. And so, so you'll find that, and I'm sure you've experienced this as, as well as I've experienced it, that, you know, we start out on this journey, and, and that journey is including this desire and this hunger on the inside of us to find out why are we here? Why did God create us? What purpose are we supposed to serve? Now, what we've been finding out for these past couple of weeks is that there is, a, first of all, that God has a will. And he expresses that will. And if you remember when Jesus prayed that prayer when he taught the disciples to pray what we call uh, the Lord's Prayer or the Our Father, he said that we're supposed to pray for his kingdom to come, his will be done. So that tells us God has a will. And Jesus gave it to us as a priority when we're praying to pray for his will. How many of you have ever found yourself in a situation where you made a decision, made a move, stepped into something, and then as soon as you got in, you realized, oh, dear God, this is not God's will. How many, how many know that? Let me see. Don't just leave me hanging here. How many know that horrible feeling of, oh, that dread? Oh, God, how do I get out of this now? And so we want to do our best to not get to that point. And so what we're doing is we're studying the general will of God. And when I say the general will of God is any one of us can open up the Bible and find out what God's will is for all of mankind, what God's will is for, for this planet, uh, for the universe, if you want to put it that way, and, and what God's will is for his children, for the church, okay? For the people that have declared themselves to be followers of Christ and believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. So it's very easy for any one of us can just find, you know, what is God's will for my life? Well, God's will for your life, the general will for God's will is, number one, that you go to heaven and not hell. I mean, that's an easy one, right? But God is not willing that any should perish, but that every one of us come to, the, come to repentance, come to the knowledge of Lord Jesus Christ, and then having repented, turned around from our old lifestyle, having received Christ our Lord and Savior, then live as children of God. Amen? That's the general will of God. That's an easy one. Then we found out that secondary to that is once we are born again, once we have received Christ and His Spirit comes to live inside of us, according to Romans chapter 5, it tells us that when the Holy Spirit came in, that the love of God came into our hearts. So the the next part of the general will of God, we say general, in other words, a blanket, we could make it a blanket statement, this is God's will for all of mankind, is that the love that he's placed in our hearts, that we would distribute that to others that have not yet experienced that. Amen? How many of you have been recipients of the love of God from somebody, uh, maybe somebody in church, some family member, somebody like that, and you know what kind of, what, how, how that changes our lives, how it impacts our life. And I remember the first time I came in touch with, and just was exposed to the love of God from a group of about 400 Christians that were gathered together at a wedding that I was, was catering. At that time, I'd been in the catering business, and you've heard me tell the story at times when I just walked into this room with 400 of these Christians in there, and it was like, whoa, like this blanket hit. It's like, what is this? These people really do love each other. It's not that I love you, brother, mm, love you, sister. It was genuine. It was genuine. It just hit you like a, a big, soft blanket. And you just, I just wanted to stay in that room. I didn't want to move. You know, it changes you when you experience the love of God. Well, that's the kind of change that God wants us to bring in people's lives. Amen? Amen. We're not supposed to hoard it for ourselves. We're supposed to share it. We're supposed to distribute it. We're called vessels. Vessels don't just contain something. They distribute it. Amen? It's God's will for us to pull away from the things in our society, in our world, in our culture that are contrary to his will. And, and it tells us in Romans chapter 12 and verse 2, if we can have that up there, it tells us that the more we pull away from that and that way of thinking, the more we will experience the perfect will of God for our lives. Let's read that scripture. Uh, the Apostle Paul writing to the church in Rome, do not conform to the pattern of this world. Now mind you now, you may be saying, I'm thinking about your society right now because obviously this extends down to us, but when this letter was written, Paul's talking about Roman culture, which was crazy. Talk about debased, no respect for life, unsatisfied, just constant, constant thirst for, for lust and for power and for material things and just, and, and just, just abusive to human nature. That's the kind of culture he was telling me, you've got to pull away from that and allow the word of God 
to transform your thinking. And then he goes on to say, when you do that, then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Amen? So the more we pull away from the old life, if we say it that way, the more we pull away from what society calls normal, the more we will experience the specific will of God for our lives. Now, we're talking about two different things now. See, the general will of God, any of us can go find that in the Bible. But you are not going to find your name in there, in a verse that say, uh, Peter, this is what you're supposed to do. Uh, uh, Jimmy, this is what you're supposed to do. Uh, Donna, this is what you're supposed to do. And we're going to talk about that probably next week or the week after before we finish this series. How do we hear from God for the specific will in our lives? And every one of us has an assignment on our lives. Every one of us has a particular thing that is God's will personally for your life and for my life. The journey we're on is to find out what is that assignment. And we know the general things, but now what about the specific things? Now, let me just preface where I'm going from this point, because it might get a little rough here today. So what I need you to settle in your heart is this, that every time God reveals his will, it is an expression of his love for us. Okay, just hold on to that for right now. Any father that's worth anything will do his best to teach his children how to stay out of the way of harm, how to avoid damaging their life. We start from young age. Okay, little Timmy, don't run out in the middle of the street. Well, why? Well, because there's cars that pass by and you can get flattened. <laughs> now, that little child said, he just doesn't want me to have any fun. No, I don't want to bury you. Now, what kind of father would sit there and watch your child run out into the traffic? Not a very good one, would he? So when God reveals things to us that seem like on the surface to be restrainers, They are restrainers because he loves us and doesn't want us to get involved in things that are going to damage us. Yes or no? Are you getting that? I need you to get that because I guarantee you for some of us in this room today, some of the things that uh, some of the scriptures we're going to go to, you probably did not know existed in there. And I'll tell you why. The majority of the Christian church world today, especially here in our country, is fixated on two expressions of the will of God. Number one, that it's God's will that we don't perish and don't go to hell. We like that one, yes? Yes. Then the other one is that God is love. Yes? Yes? You ask the average Christian to tell you what God is. Well, you've got his love. (laughs) And then it usually follows with, and he loves me just like I am. (laughs) And then I like to add, and he loves you too much to leave you just as you are. (laughs) Yes or no? Okay, because now if we're going to say that we want to know the will of God, then we have to know the will of God as it pertains to different facets of our life. Not just the ones that are feel good. Again, I will remind you of this, that every time God reveals his will, it is an expression of his love towards mankind. Just like that father sitting on the front porch with his child will say to them, do not run off this property. Do not run into the street. Do not touch the hot stove. Do not, you know, you don't allow a little two-year-old child to run their own bath water because if they only turn on the hot water, what's going to happen? That child's going to get scalded. So it's the same thing with our Father in heaven. He just doesn't just sit on the porch in heaven and let you just run wild into whatever in life you're going to encounter, knowing that it's going to damage you spiritually, emotionally, and sometimes physically. He wants what's best for us. Would you please turn to somebody next to you in case they didn't hear that and say that with me? He wants, turn around, get turn. He wants the best for us. Are you with me? So let's jump into the first one. Now, these are not in the order of importance. They're just in the order that I kind of like just put them down here. All right? It is God's general will for his people 
that they would pray so that we can lead peaceful lives. Amen? I'm going to start off with an easy one. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. This is the Apostle Paul writing to a very young pastor, giving him instruction of how he's going to run his church. I urge you, first of all, to pray for all people. Ask God to help them. Intercede on their behalf. Give thanks for them. Pray this way for kings and all who are in authority. And here it is. So that we can live what? Peaceful and quiet lives marked by godliness and dignity. And then it goes on to say, this is good and it pleases God our Savior. And we should want to please him. Who wants everyone to be saved. Here we go now. It's back to the general will of God for mankind. Who wants everyone to be saved and to understand the truth. Now, you're going to have an opportunity today to understand some truth. For there is one God and one mediator who can reconcile God and humanity. The man, Christ Jesus, who he gave his life to purchase freedom for everyone. This is a message God gave to the world just at the right time. Okay, so let's go back to verse 2. Verse 2 states that we're supposed to pray for kings and all who are in authority so that we can live peaceful, quiet lives marked by godliness and dignity. Again, I want to take you back to the historical reference here. Paul is not telling us to pray in a democratic society. He had no idea of the society you and I would live in. He had no idea of the type of government you and I would live in. He had no idea of what framework of government there would be. He had no idea that this side of the planet even existed at that point in time. He's talking about a crazy, demon-possessed maniac who sat on a throne in Rome. And he's telling these people, you better pray, because this guy's capable of crazy stuff. We're talking about Nero. We're talking about Caligula, who had no respect for life, no respect for decency. He said, if you don't pray, we're not going to be able to live lives that are peaceful. Why did he need to live a life that's peaceful? Why did they need peace during this time? Because the gospel needed to spread over the entire Mediterranean world. And there's no way it could spread if there's wars, if there's civil unrest, if there's just uh, uh, dangers of bandits and lawlessness. The gospel could not go forth. You could not live. And if you don't have somebody who's willing, and at some times during this period of the Roman Empire, there were some emperors that really didn't care if people turned to Christianity. So they could live lives that were marked with what? Godliness. And what? Dignity. There were other times that other leaders would rise up, and that was impossible. Now, how does that pertain to us to today? I'm going to step out here. You, as a believer, are not called to point fingers, to criticize, to accuse, to side with those that want to stir up rebellion and rioting and lawlessness in this nation. That is not God's will for his children. What is God's will? That we would pray for our leaders and all in authority so that we would live peaceful lives. For what reason? So that we can have an effect on our society so that we can, we, can, we can not only have an effect here in this country, but we also need to pray for leaders overseas because, you see, when wars break out overseas, it interrupts missionary work. It interrupts feeding the, the needy and the poor and the refugees. There are refugees right now that have been suffering for years in the Middle East. And every, we send billions and billions, and where does it end up? In the pockets of the dictators of their countries. So, can I even be more blunt? Go ahead, tell me I can. Come on. <laughs> Stop spewing more hatred on Facebook. Amen. Stop siding with people that want to bring more division into this nation. That is not the will of God for his people. Well, I don't agree. There's a lot of things I don't agree with either. But you know what? My disagreement's not going to change anything until I pray. Because people do change. Governments change. Leadership changes. But nothing's going to change, and you're only going to make it worse when you start getting on your soapbox and you start siding with lawlessness. Are you listening to me? Listen to something else. The world is watching us. Your friends are watching you. 
Now, I don't just believe that now. There's a lot of things I disagree with now. But I've believed this all along. It has nothing to do with who's in power. It has to do with, are we praying? Because there's a scripture in the Bible that says this, that God can take the heart of the king and turn it any which way he wants. But it's not going to happen if we don't pray. It's not going to happen if, 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 we don't, if we don't pull together as believers. We need to have people in government that at least hear well, I'm willing to at least hear the principles of the word of God. Otherwise, how are we going to live peaceful lives? Do you know that as we're sitting here right now, that there are people in other parts of the country, other parts of the world, excuse me, other nations, that they didn't have the freedom to just walk into a building like we have this morning and raise our hands, sing our songs, clap our hands. They did not have that freedom. And the reason why they didn't have that freedom is somewhere along in their history, the church in that nation or a church outside of that nation stopped praying for the leadership there and ungodly individuals came up in power who forbid their people to live lives that are marked with godliness and dignity. You want to see that happen here? No. For the sake of the gospel, for the sake of the lost, for the sake of the people that are walking around like the blind lead the blind. Doesn't mean you have to agree. It doesn't mean you have to support. What it means is we are called to pray. You got it? Could I move on? All right, now, now it's going to get a little bit tougher here. And again, I want to remind you that every time there's an expression of God's will in the Bible, it is his love towards mankind. Are you catching this? You're not convincing me this morning. Are you catching this? Are you realizing that there is a reason why God tells us, stay away from this, stay away from that, don't do this, don't do that? Yes. Okay, good. It is God's will for mankind, for his children especially, to practice moderation. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15. I want, stick with me for the first few verses. Be very careful then how you live. Not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Verse 17, I want you to specifically hone in on this. Therefore, do not be foolish. Does anybody in this room want to be foolish? Does anybody on this planet purposely want to be foolish? Of course not. So in order to not be foolish, he tells us, but we must understand what the Lord's will is. And normally, that's where we stop. Verse 17, at that end, we stop. But look at the very next thing he talks about. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Do not get drunk on wine. Now, I'm going to admit something to you that it's taken me many, many decades to get to the point to be able to say what I'm going to say. It doesn't say that you can't drink wine. But there's a difference between having a glass of wine with your meal and getting slammed. Uh, are, you, are you following me today? Okay, there's, there's a big difference. <laughs> and don't tell me that it takes, you know, you it takes you 12 glasses of wine for you to really enjoy your meal. No, there's a different motive there. Are you, are you, are you with me today? And let me, let me just roll this out for you because we're going to see a little bit more of the love of God here. Now watch this. I've been, I've been reading these scriptures for 33 years, and it wasn't until in the middle of the teaching last night's service that all of a sudden it was like, boop. Let me ask you this question. Why do people drink? Mean, why do people drink? I'm not talking about a little wine with your meal. Why, and, and by the way, I gotta throw this in because my wife really She's not here right now, but my wife last night on the way home, she said to me, you know, you didn't tell them that we don't drink. I said, I didn't. I thought I, I... She said, because the way you presented this last night, they may think that you're one of them that sits here. I said, no. <laughs> Listen to me. Per then this is me. I'm not telling you this is you. This is me. I personally, my wife and I, have not touched a drop of alcohol since I got born again. That's 33 years. That's me. That was my choice. Okay? Uh, that's my choice. That doesn't mean you have to follow that. But that was a conviction that God placed in my heart from day one. 
I think it's because he knew eventually I would be in the ministry. And our opinion, I'm saying opinion, say a word opinion. opinion. Our opinion is that anybody in ministry should not have any alcohol. That's our opinion. Okay? Too many people have gotten off in crazy areas because they let go in that one particular facet of their lives. That's me. That, don't go out here and say, Pastor Joe said we should not drink. No, Pastor Joe said he doesn't drink. All right, you got that? Now, now but again, there is a difference between a person who has a glass, like, you know, you know I can't have a piece of pepperoni pizza and a beer. <laughs> yeah, but you don't need to have a whole case, okay? <laughs> It just doesn't taste the same. Okay, well, God bless you. For me, I, I can't eat anything without that stuff, and it tastes just as good. But that's me. You do what you want in your house, okay? But now follow me here. Look at the love and the goodness and the compassion of God. Do not get drunk on wine. Now, why does a person intentionally go get drunk? Why does a person go crawl into a bottle and stay there for weeks at a time? Is it not because of some kind of escape? Is it not because the pain is so bad? Is it not because you're trying to get away from some tragedy that happened in the past, some wound that was inflicted, some betrayal, some whatever? It's a pain, it's a void, it's, a, it's nagging, and so, but look at the love of God. He tells us what to do. Don't get drunk in wine, which leads to debauchery. You know what debauchery is? Debauchery, I can explain debauchery to you because it's such a religious word. Debauchery is two o'clock in the morning, on a Saturday night in Seaside Heights in the middle of the summer when the bars get out. That's debauchery. It's what it sounds like. It's what it smells like. It's what it looks like. That's debauchery. All right, do we have the clear picture now? Okay, good. So what is he saying here? Now, God's not without compassion for us because he recognized that most people that are going to get drunk and get slammed and just get out of their mind just stupid, just completely drunk, it's because of our hurt. So what does he offer us? Look at the word instead. Instead, be what? Filled with the Spirit. Why is that such a much better alternative? Because when you crawl out of that bottle, your problems are still there. The hurt is still there. The damage is even worse now because now trying to escape that original problem, you've now damaged your spouse or you've damaged a relationship or you've damaged your children or you, or you lost your job or your finances are in the toilet, whatever. Now you crawl out of that bottle and life is 10 times worse. But when you get filled with the Spirit... And look what it says. Keep going to the next verse. But be filled with the Spirit. Do what? Speaking to one another with psalms and hymns. Not across the bar to the bartender. You know what I'm going through in my life right now? No. You know what? The bartender doesn't care. He, this is the hundredth time he's hearing that story that night. But watch this now. Speaking to one another with psalms and hymns and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart. To who? The Lord. Why to the Lord? The bartender can't help you, but the Lord can. Yeah. Are you getting this today? Yeah. Do you see what would appear to be a restriction is actually the love of God being expressed towards us and giving us an, not, not only an alternative, but an actual solution to that hurt, to that wound, to that problem. Now, that goes with any kind of substance abuse. Don't run to that stuff. Go get filled. Amen. Get filled with the Holy Ghost. Get filled with the Spirit. Just, just draw yourself. Start worshiping God. Why? He's going to help you. He is your, your help in time of need. He is your healer. He is your deliverer. He is the one that's going to bring you peace. He is the one that's going to give you final closure in that area. No bottle, no substance is going to be able to do that. Are you with me today? Yes. You ready for the next one? I hope so. Because these get progressively tougher. It is God's will for his people to stay pure. Oh, are you going to go there, Pastor? Yeah. Yeah, we got to go there. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 1. Finally, even Paul left us to the end of his letter. <laughs> 
Paul let, writes to the, the people of Thessalonica and he addresses all these things that he's like, mm, I gotta do it. Finally, <laughs> dear brothers and sisters, we urge you in the name of the Lord, now he's using Jesus too, we urge you in the name of the Lord Jesus to live in a way that pleases God as we have taught you. Amen. And here's another area that gets sticky. Well, you, God loves me, you know, God loves me, God's forgiven me, God takes me just the way I am. But he does want us to live in a way that pleases him. Should we not want to please the one who sacrificed his life for us? Should we not want to please the one who laid everything down for us? Should we not want to please the one that came out of heaven where everything is perfect, comes to this rotten, miserable, diseased earth to save us, and then we slap him in the face by just living any way we want because you have to roll, you know, I'm saved now. <laughs> You live this way already and we encourage you to do so even more. For you remember what we taught you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. Verse three, here it comes. For God's will is for you to be holy, so stay away from all sexual sin. Then each of you will control his own body and live in holiness and honor, not in lustful passion like the pagans who do not know God and his ways. Pastor, I just want to know God's will for my life. I want to know God's, here it is. Here it is. Just want to know what God has for me. What's my purpose here? Well, he's telling us what it's not. Every revelation of God's will is actually an expression of his love for us. We are a generation of damaged individuals. We live in a society of damaged individuals for decades and decades now. Why? Because these principles were totally forgotten. Because of how powerful the sex drive is, God intended that sexual activity be held in the strictest of boundaries. And those boundaries are in biblical marriage between one husband and one wife where it can be the greatest expression of his love. Amen. The unfortunate thing is that most sexual practices today, most sexual relationships today are based on pagan philosophy rather than the character and nature of God. It is need-based, it is selfish, it encourages self-pleasure rather than sex as an expression of love. It is sensory-driven, eyesight, pictures, videos, all this kind of stuff. That's why there's such an epidemic of porno addiction. Ap epidemic, epidemic. Just keep looking straight ahead, guys. Just keep looking straight ahead. <laughs> It's not anywhere near what God intended it to be. It was supposed to be something that sealed a relationship, not initiated a relationship. I'm not even going to ask you to say amen. Verse 6, and let's get into this even more. Now these are, these are commandments from God. These are not suggestions. Never harm or cheat a fellow believer in this matter by violating his wife. Watch this now. For the Lord avenges all such sins. Wait a second, Pastor. I thought we were under, this is grace, the age of grace. Yeah, it's his grace that you're still standing. For the Lord avenges all such sins as we have solemnly warned you before. Verse 7. God has called us to live holy lives, not impure lives. Therefore, anyone who refuses to live by these rules is not disobeying human teaching, but is rejecting God who gives his Holy Spirit to you. Just let it settle in. We have damaged souls. We have people whose bodies are suffering from diseases. Relationships torn apart. Children suffering because one parent or the other just can't seem to stay out of somebody's bed. children who are going to end up in counseling because they walked in the room and saw their dad watching something on the computer they had no business watching. If we can't talk about this stuff here, where are we going to talk about it? This is serious. Because you're not going to hear this on TV. And your kids are not going to hear this in school. 
We have so, dis- I'm talking about in the church. Forget about outside the church. <laughs> I'm talking about within the church. We don't call cheating adultery anymore. It's just, a, it's just well, you know, it was just a fling. Fling. Well, you, who are you to judge me? I, I'm nobody, but the word does. And it's God's grace that he warns us ahead of time. So that possibly somebody in here who's this close to having an affair will come to their senses and turn around and go in the other direction. Is that not what repentance is? To change your mind about something and turn around and go in the other direction. I know this is serious stuff. But you see, our lives, some of our lives are in turmoil, some of our families in turmoil, some of our... (laughs) Because we're not walking in the center of God's will. We're not in the zone. We're out there with the rest of the society and we think that God just winks at it. Now yes, does he forgive? Absolutely he forgives. But if he can get you to avoid the situation before he has to forgive it, isn't that even better? Now you don't understand the situation I'm in. You know, my marriage was over long ago. Don't give me that garbage. Have you tried to reconcile? Have you gone for counseling? Have you gone for help? Some people wait until it's so bad, purposely, so they can't be reconciled because they don't have enough guts to tell the spouse, I want out. Oh, is this too real today? Is this too real? His will for us is that we live pure lives, holy lives, and we can do it. Pastor, you don't understand. This has been a lifestyle for me for so long. I, I don't know how I'm going to stop. The grace of God. The gra- Listen to me. The grace of God will empower you to overcome in an area that Jesus has already delivered you from. If God would just say, no, God already delivered you. You now have to take that and, and cause that to empower you so that when that temptation rises up again, you go, no, no, I am an overcomer. I am not overcome. And I take this grace, Father, and in the name of Jesus, I am not going to fall to this temptation. In the name of Jesus, I'm not going to go to the computer at 3 o'clock in the morning when everybody else is sleeping. In the name of Jesus, I'm not going to continue this relationship at work with this one here. And I'm not going to continue you know, getting involved in, in, in a relationship that I should have no business to get involved in. Well, it's just, we're just friends. That's how it starts. I remind you, every revelation of God's will is actually an expression of his love for us. He loves you. He loves your spouse. He loves your children. He loves your grandchildren that don't even exist yet. Because when that conduct gets entrenched in a family, it goes from generation to generation. Somebody's got to have enough guts. Somebody's got to have enough backbone. Somebody's got to have enough willpower to just press into God and say, Father, in the natural, I can't do this, but I take hold of your grace by faith because your grace teaches me to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts so that I can live righteously and soberly in this present age until Jesus comes back. So what happened, Pastor, if I've already fallen in those areas? There's forgiveness. There's forgiveness. God's will is for us to maintain an attitude of repentance, an attitude of humility and honesty. Don't try. The worst thing you can do in sin is to try to justify it. Do not justify it. Call it what it is. And then bring it before God. Why? Because God gives grace to the humble but he resists the proud. Don't start trying to justify it, okay? 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he's talking to believers. I don't care what you hear and what you hear people even in national television teach. Okay, this scripture is here as a principle for us to operate in. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to what? Forgive us our sins and what? To cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What does this mean? You know, for the longest time, for probably the first eight to ten years of my Christian life, I thought this meant that every time I sinned, I lost my righteousness. That's not what it's saying. What it's saying is that we will confess our sins, he forgives us, and then he cleanses us from all the garbage we pick up while we're acting like a person who's not righteous. 
Are you getting this? Why? Because you pick things up when you get involved in sin. And they cling to you. And we're not, it's, it's one, yeah, definitely. Thank God that we're forgiven. Thank God that Jesus forgave everything at the cross. But what about this junk that I'm carrying now? What about this habit that I developed now? What about this thing that's clinging to me? How do I get rid of this? He's faithful and just to do what? Forgive us and cleanse us from what? All unrighteousness. Are you catching this today? Listen, I know, my God, we're saving somebody's life today. We're saving somebody's marriage today. We're saving somebody's children today. God's will for our life is to live holy. What does that mean? Is you going to walk around with a halo on your head? No. The word holy means separate. Yes. Separate. That we don't act like everybody else that doesn't know this. That we who have the spirit of God living on the inside of us will rise up and say, I'm not going to conduct myself that way. But what about me, Pastor? What about my happiness? Have you never heard of a word called sacrifice? And what if you have to sacrifice your life for your children's? What if you have to sacrifice your temporary pleasure so that the generations that follow you don't have the shame of a scandal overshadowing that? Are they not worth it? You're safe now. I ran out of time. <laughs> but listen to me. With all my heart, with all my heart, please, I want you to leave this place today understanding that anything that seems like a restrainer in the Word of God is not there to stop you from living and to stop you from enjoying life. Oh, <laughs> it's there to guarantee you to have the abundant life that Jesus died for us to have. Amen? Amen? Thank you for watching today. We pray this message has impacted and blessed you. New Beginnings Church exists to lead people into a life-changing, spirit-empowered relationship with Jesus Christ. If you'd like to support the vision here at New Beginnings, just head over to our Give page. Thank you again for joining us. We hope to see you soon.